My name is Siva Raghupati. Uh, just a bit of introduction about myself. I've been with AWS for about seven years. Um, and uh, first three years, I helped build a couple of services. I'm on DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database service. Uh, we, if you had been at the keynote, uh, there was quite a few sessions and, and, and things about Dy DynamoDB. And then the second service I helped build was Amazon RDS, which is a relational database service. And for the last four years, I've been working with customers, including Amazon.com, and helping them build big data solutions on AWS. I lead our big data solutions architecture team for Americas, so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, let's get started. So I'm going to go through a little bit faster because uh, we lost about uh, 10 minutes, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, uh, you know, probably towards the course of the presentation. Um, I will not have time to take questions here, uh, but I'm happy to stay back and take questions at the end. So in terms of the agenda, I'll go through some of the big data challenges and our opportunities uh, that, that are available, and then we'll, I'll go through how to simplify big data processing. I'm gonna break the big data processing into a pipeline comprising of multiple stages, collect, store, process, or analyze, and consume. And in each stage, I'm gonna help you pick the right tool using you know, various criteria. And, and then towards the end, I will pull all of that together into um, a, a reference architecture, then I will actually implement the reference architecture using some design patterns. And uh, so uh, kindly fill out the evaluations. Uh, it's gonna be very helpful uh, to refine the talk moving forward, and uh, let's get started. So the volume, velocity, and variety of big data is ever increasing. Routinely, customers are building systems um, that can handle Tens, or tens of thousands of requests per second in the case of real-time bidding, uh, there are systems that are actually sending about a million requests per second being served out of DynamoDB. Um, and uh, you know, in, in large volumes of data are being ingested uh, into the AWS. Customers are building systems that can ingest about 150, 200 terabytes of data a day. And uh, in addition to files and uh, transactional workloads, uh, Events are pretty popular with, uh, with the advent of IoT and sensors and devices. Um, billions of events are being pumped into AWS for analysis, for real-time analysis. Uh, the one thing that I've observed over the last five years is that even five years ago, these systems were hard to build, but nowadays these systems are being built by potentially a couple of developers in a few weeks. Uh, how, how do customers build those massive systems so fast? They're gonna use some of the architectures, tried and tested architectures that I'll actually discuss the course of the discussion today. And um, uh, big data is evolving from batch processing to real-time or stream processing to machine learning. And uh, what that means is instead of sending, if you're a utility company, instead of sending a customer some monthly or a weekly bill, you wanna allow them to you know, set thresholds so you can actually send them a, a text message or a, or, a, or, or a notification that they're about to breach their you know, um, the, the spending limits. And more importantly, in addition to that, it'll be nice to build a system that actually tells them that they're about to go beyond their spend and potentially, you know, upgrade to a new plan or whatnot. So, you know, this is just one scenario, depending upon what use cases you're dealing with. Um, you know, I think being very customer-centric and reactive to customers is the biggest differentiator now. Um, you know, for example, I was talking to a CTO of an airline company and then this person tells me, you know, all airlines use pretty much the same jets, you know, either made by Boeing or Airbus. The biggest differentiator for us is to be customer centric. If I can reroute, you know, if a customer is going to show up to the airport late, if they're going to miss the flight, if I can automatically reroute them and tell them, by the way, they've been rerouted, they'll be much more happy. So in other, in other words, to build customer centric systems, you're going to be at, you're, you're going to need to process fast moving data. And also you want to, you know, build machine learning into your systems to, to, to build you know, to, to, pre to predict what's gonna happen as well. So it's gonna be, so in the architectures that I'm gonna paint today, I'm gonna actually, you know, build in machine learning into the pipeline, if you will. Uh, so luckily, there's a plethora of tools. On the left side, the open source ecosystem is building, you know, tons of products or services. Um, if you go to any big data conference, uh, Spark is the answer, no matter what the question is. And um, so, Hopefully some of you are saying, are smiling, so it should be true. Uh, but apparently Spark is challenged, is gonna be challenged by this little squirrel on the left bottom. Do you know what, does anybody know what that squirrel is? Apache Flink. Um, so, uh, so I think the one of the, and on the right side, you know, AWS, uh, we build a lot of services um, to innovate on behalf of customers, starting from Amazon Elastic MapReduce to S3 to DynamoDB, uh, Kinesis, et cetera. Then I have only one space for one more icon left. Uh, next year, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Uh, maybe create two slides here. 
so so the, as, as an architect, the challenge here is that, you know, how do I replace a specific module in my data processing pipeline as I get better technology? So in other words, you should be, you should be building modular systems to be able to replace components as you get better technology. That's, some, that's something that you don't think after the fact, you should think through ahead of time. So, uh, so those are some of the considerations for me as an architect on a daily basis, these are the questions I get. You know, is there a reference architecture? What tools should I use? Uh, how, and more importantly, why? Um, I think if you answer the question why, the how and to, uh, how, et cetera, it kind of typically falls into place. So I'm gonna spend a bunch of time on, on why today. You know, as a builder of services, that's a, that's a unique perspective that I have I'm gonna share with you today. And um, so before I get started, I wanna introduce five architectural principles that have that I've held the test of time for me. If there's one takeaway in this presentation, I think this is this slide. So, um, and uh, first of all, when you're building big data systems, you should build decoupled systems. You know, what that means is, on a, on a physical sense, I'm a mechanical engineer, I think of this as a gear or a clutch. You know, nicely decoupled systems allow both, both the producers and the consumers to go at their own speed, and then coupling them in a fashion that, that doesn't blow up the system, in essence. So in a big data processing pipeline, it looks like you know, store, process, store, process, repeats itself multiple times. The storage subsystem acts as a decoupling mechanism between multiple processing or analysis stages. And um, using the right tool for the job is critical. When we build services at AWS, we build them to do their function uh, or a, a subset of functions extremely well at a very low cost. So oftentimes, you know, picking the right tool and match, matching your application characteristics to the characteristics of the service is gonna be critical. And um, using Lambda architecture ideas, this is not the AWS Lambda product, it's very cool, as Matt laid out this morning, uh, but this is Lambda architecture where you actually combine both batch and our real-time or speed processing through a serving layer and serve and answer both from both batch systems and real-time systems, and also the ability to collect immu immutable immutable logs, you know. Typically, you know, S3 is so cheap and so scalable, there's no reason to actually remove anything that your company receives, any data your company receives. I think it's the best practice to keep all the data as it comes um, in S3 compressed and probably, you know, moved to Glacier um, so you can actually go back and analyze the data and, 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 and obtain some of the perishable insights. And many, many times you don't know what, what question you may be asking from your data, and if you actually scrub the data and only st store what you want, you may be losing a lot of valuable insights. So actually taking a stream of data as it arrives and keeping it securely in S3 uh, is gonna be super important. And uh, leveraging AWS managed services is key. I told you, you know, large scale systems are built by a couple of developers or a few developers in a few weeks. Using AWS managed services increases the speed of innovation rather than you actually, you know, AWS has compute and storage and all the building blocks so you can actually install any software and build any system on it. But if you have a packaged service uh, or a ma fully managed service available for a specific function, it's much more efficient um, and uh, it increases your speed, of, speed to delivery and speed to innovation, if you will, if you build a managed service. Typically these services are highly scalable, they're elastic and they are secure and there is no admin or very less admin, you know, which saves time and um, efficiency and improves efficiency over the longer run. Last but not the least, big data should not be equals big cost. You should be cost conscious when you build a system. So often what happens is when I do, I do often do design reviews with customers, it's typically a one hour call or a discussion, 20 minutes into the design I park, then I say, well, let's, let's compute the cost of the system. There's usually one or two answers that comes up. In a rare cases, the customer says, let's stop, I can't pay the bill, it's too expensive, maybe I should change something, maybe we should change the service or, or, or actually redefine the requirements. So being cost conscious often results in a better design. So I think this is the, sort of the, going to be the biggest takeaway. The rest of the presentation I'm going to be spending on actually you know, expanding on this slide. And, um, now let's simplify big data processing. The more and more I build big data systems, it looks like a big pipe with the data coming in on one side and answers coming out on the other side. And there's typically multiple stages, collect, store, process, analyze. I'm gonna use this change inter term interchangeably, process or analyze, and then consume. And now what also happens is typically the store and process repeats itself in multiple cycles. So you shape the data in a form that's gonna be easily accessible by the downstream system. And, um, and what, what goes in there and what technology that you use often is dictated by what I call time to answer or latency of the pipe and the throughput of the pipe, which comprises of the request, number of requests per second and the size of the payload, and also cost. So that's it. 
um, as simple as that. So now let's look at the details uh, a little more. So in the collect stage, typically you're dealing with multiple data types. You know, you may be writing to a transaction. In the, in the case of real-time bidding, typically you're looking up a user profile, potentially a million, millions of requests per second, or hundreds of thousands of requests per second, and actually servicing an ad platform. Yes, you know, I'm going to I'm going to bid for this or not bid for this, right? That's typically a transactional kind of workload. Typically, that that workload comprises of database records, you know, moving really fast between applications and the, and the database. Um, or you may be actually using Logstash and, 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 and shipping documents into a data store. Um, typically, it's a search store. Or it may be files. You know, your application servers may be packaging this as files. It could be Log4j files. Or you may be using Flume. Or you may be using Amazon CloudWatch logs, if you will, uh, for moving the data into S3. Um, or in the case of messaging system, this may be messages you know, going to some form of a queue. And uh, last but not the least, with the advent of IoT, there's a lot of streaming data going in from sensors, devices, and IoT platform. These are the various types of data that you have to deal with today, not just database records, but, but, but all of these. Uh, now let's look at the details of the store. Uh, for messaging, typically Amazon SQS is a managed service for, uh, for, for storing your messages at scale. So you simply create an abstraction of a queue and then you send messages to the queue and you receive messages from, from the queue. You don't have to pretty much provision any capacity or throughput. We automatically provision the throughput. We store the messages in multiple data centers, typically three data centers. And then we scale this based on the total number of messages you send. Messages usually hang around for about 14 days and then they get recycled after that. And so uh, it's probably the best service to use for storing, storing messages. Um, Apache Kafka is very popular. I was just talking to a customer just before the talk. Uh, they were potentially using Apache Kafka. There's some kind of a real-time bidding platform using Apache Kafka for, for storing messages. Um, and you can actually you know, build the Apache Kafka cluster on top of AWS using the compute and, and storage infrastructure. In fact, Matt announced the new e EBS volumes. Those are going to be very helpful for, Ka for, for building Kafka systems. And uh, Amazon Kinesis Streams is a managed service for doing the same function that Kafka does. Um, and uh, there are three different platforms uh, under Kinesis title. Uh, first is Kinesis Streams, which is used for stream storage and processing. The second is Kinesis Firehose. Uh, it is very similar to, I mean, this is an enhancement we made because of customer requests. So typically what people were doing were they were writing to Kinesis Streams, and the, and the first application simply put the data in S3. So we figured we'll do this on behalf of the customers. We invented Kinesis Firehose. So when you, when you, when you write to Kinesis Firehose, you can choose the destination. It could be S3 or a Redshift table, or um, we introduced, uh, we're going to be introducing tomorrow, you know, automatically writing to Elasticsearch. So if, if, if you're doing any of these three, you can potentially write to a Firehose and automatically, you know, transport the data to, the, to the one of the three destinations that you choose. And uh, finally, uh, about a year ago or so, we introduced DynamoDB update streams. Now, update streams, I think of that as, you know, uh, change data capture for tables. So in other words, if you're writing to a DynamoDB table, if you enable an update stream, what happens is the change, you can, when you create a stream, you can tell whether just send updated records, both the old image and the new image, or just the new image and the keys that changed. So the update stream has all this data that you, you can do a variety of computations from the, from the change data capture uh, that you are uh, capturing you know, from, a, from a table stream. You know, classic things, maybe you may be updating a cache, or you may be updating an elastic search store for the metadata, for the metadata that you're writing in DynamoDB. You can, you can build this off of, the, off of the data you're putting in DynamoDB. Uh, so why stream storage? Stream storage typically allows you to decouple producers and consumers. It provides a persistent buffer. and um, it can also, it enables uh, collecting multiple streams. If you have those producers one, two, three, and four, um, having the hot data coming in, rather than holding the data with them, they can simply write to an endpoint and move forward. And uh, uh, one of the critical functions of a stream is to pr preserve client ordering. Uh, that allows a whole bunch of functionality. For example, let's assume you're building a clickstream analytics system. You know, your customer is actually, think of, you know, you imagine you being in Amazon.com and you're clicking through various things, and then you finally abandon, you want to, you look like you like a product and you finally abandon the cart. You didn't actually put that in the cart. We can find out actually where, where a customer abandoned the cart. 
if let's say multiple people abandon the card, probably there's something wrong with our website, for example. So such computations can be run if you actually put the data in a, in a stream storage uh, subsystem. And um, so uh, the other piece is called streaming map produce, which, which essentially means you know, if I have a consumer that is consuming from the stream, uh, the frameworks that come with you know, Kinesis or Kafka, essentially the KCL Kinesis client library, um, in, and our Spark streaming, et cetera, allow you to lock on a specific thread onto uh, a shard or a partition. Uh, what happens is that thread you know, is guaranteed to get all the, if let's say the producer is designating itself as red, or the second producer is designating itself as green, all the, all the red will certainly go to a specific partition, one and only that partition, and then a thread that's latched on to that partition is guaranteed to get the, get the data in the same sequence. So you can do computations like give me the min, max, average, and et cetera. And uh, so that's, that's the essence, that's essentially called streaming map reduce. And last but not the least, uh, these uh, cloud st streaming storage system allows for parallel consumption, which means if the data is coming into your company, if there are two teams that want to process the data in parallel and do whatever they want to do with the data, they don't have to depend on one another, right? If you put this in a queue, you know, maybe an upstream system needs to process it and hand this off to another downstream system, whereas in this case, multiple parallel consumers can consume the data and all CEOs and CTOs and leads love this because they can enable innovation in parallel. In other words, they can decouple two teams by simply sticking the data in Kinesis and giving them you know, access, to, access to the data downstream. And this has been, um, you know, it's sort of not directly, uh, this is an innovation that, that the streaming storage systems enable. That's why they're, more power, they're getting more powerful than potentially putting this in queues. Um, now, now, what about queues and pubs up? You know, both queues, like SQS, for example, allows you to decouple uh, systems. It allows you a persistent buffer. It also allows you to multiple, collect multiple streams of data. But what it doesn't have is there's no client ordering guarantee. There's no parallel consumption possible. And there's no streaming map reduce as well. Uh, one exception to this is if you, have, if you write into uh, SNS, you can actually you know, um, route the messages into multiple queues and enable parallel consumption, that being the exception. Uh, but this is sort of the essential difference between the two. What I've done here is uh, I don't expect you to, I don't expect to go through each every line here, but I've actually given this, uh, this is sort of a summary of all the analysis that I've done for various customers. What I've done here is I've taken various attributes that are, that are necessary for stream processing, and then I've tabulated across all the, you know, Kinesis, DynamoDB streams, Kafka, et cetera. For example, you know, is this a managed service, yes or no? You know, is there guaranteed ordering? Yes or no, for example, in the case of SQS, there's no guaranteed ordering. You know, is the delivery exactly once or at least once? You know, for example, if you're building a metering system, uh, you know, under extreme circumstances, both Kinesis and Kafka will give you the same record twice. So if you want to build a system and don't want to double bill your customer, you need to, you need to build deduping into your pipeline. So, so that's exactly how you kind of find out. For example, uh, DynamoDB streams, you know, guarantees exactly one's processing for the client. So those, I found these things very helpful for customers. And then last but not the least, uh, the one thing I want to touch on here is the cost. Oftentimes I find Kinesis streams to be the cheapest way of doing, you know, a sa saving a stream. Kafka is also fairly cheap, but only the admin cost sometimes is higher, you know, maintaining the cluster or a lifetime can be, can be fairly time consuming as well. So I would start with probably either Kinesis or Kafka and then use other solutions uh, if need be. That would be my sort of the single recommendation there. And um, so now let's go into the file storage. Uh, so if you have files that you're actually storing on Amazon, the best place to put that would be Amazon S3. Uh, why is S3 good for big data? S3 is natively supported by almost all big data frameworks, you know, Spark, Hive, Presto, et cetera. And there's no need to run compute when you're actually storing data in S3. If you're running a HDFS cluster, you have to have all these machines humming you know, for, for, for storage to be available in HDFS. But in this case of S3, you don't have to run any compute. You can simply put your data into S3. Uh, also, this allows you to run multiple clusters, so you can have you know, specific processing, three different clusters or four different clusters processing the same data set for different purposes. And you can also use, since you don't need to have persist machines actually for serving the data, you can also have, you know, spot instances which are very, you know, inexpensive typically compared to, you know, the, the demand, on-demand pricing. You can use spot instances to do the processing. And, uh, and so 
S3 also is um, very scalable. Um, in, in fact, there's no limits on the number of objects that you can put in S3. It has very high aggregate bandwidth. Uh, there's no, no, no throughput limits, if you will, uh, as long as you can scale out the computation across multiple nodes in terms of for puts and gets. And uh, it's also highly available. Um, S3 data is stored in at least three data centers, um, and it's designed for 11 nines durability. And S3 also supports tiered storage, uh, which means you can actually set a policy in S3, a lifecycle policy. Let's say if you want to expire or uh, move all the objects from S3 standard storage to Glacier. Uh, standard storage is about three cents per gigabyte per month. Glacier is about you know, one tenth of a penny per gigabyte per month. You, know, you can set a policy to move the data automatically you know, from, from standard, to, uh, standard to Glacier, for example. S3 is also secure. It supports both encryption and flight uh, through SSL and encryption at rest using, using various key management techniques. And uh, what about HDFS and Glacier? Now, HDFS is quickly becoming sort of a cache for big data processing. If you have multiple stages in the big data processing pipeline, typically the first stage gets the data from S3, you know, does some processing, stores it in HDFS, the second stage picks up from there, and the end result is also stored, in, stored, stored, in, stored back in S3. Um, and, um, you know, we also introduced uh, S3, uh, in addition to S3 standard, S3 infrequent access. You can also set a policy if you're, if you're infrequently accessing the data. You can also set a policy to move data to infrequently access that will actually make your storage bill uh, cheaper than putting it in standard. And we talked about the Glacier scenario there. So the way I see this is sort of a tiered storage mechanism with a very, very hot uh, volatile data in HDFS and potentially, you know, S3 for being for both standard and infrequent access and Glacier for archival storage. So now uh, let's go into the cache and the database and search. So um, this is the wrong way to build uh, your database uh, tier or the data tier for big data. About 20 years ago, this was a great way to build this, but not anymore. Because if you're doing a million writes per second, it's hard to find a relational database that'll do a million writes per second. And if you're doing you know, million writes per second and 10 reads per second in Dynamo, you can exactly ask for that. Um, you, if, you, if you're putting that in a relational database, you probably get million writes per second and a lot more reads per second, which you don't want. So quickly, uh, thinking of your database tier as comprising of either cache, combination of cache, NoSQL, SQL, and search is typically the right solution. And um, so uh, the immediate question when I say that to customers is like, hey, how do you keep all these things sync? So here is a pattern. You know, typically, if you are going to write your high throughput data into DynamoDB, you can actually either have a KCL application or an AWS Lambda consume to the update stream, and then you can update an Elastic Cache cluster or an Elastic Search cluster. So, you know, for search as well as for caching. So, this is a design pattern that you know some customers are using, and they find it very, very effective. And um, what data store should I use? Again, I tend to use four different techniques for picking this, making the decision. And it depends on what data structure and the structure of the data, your access pattern, your data access characteristics, you know, whether they're dealing with hot, warm, or cold data, and, and the cost. So if, you're, if your data access pattern is typically puts and gets, using a cache or NoSQL is usually the right solution. If, it's, if you're dealing with simple one-to-many or many-to-many -many relationships using NoSQL, um, is the right solution. For example, in DynamoDB, you can use a you know, partition key and a range key, the partition key being the one side and the range key being the, being the end side, and the, or the sort key, we call the sort key nowadays. Uh, if, you, if you're having multiple cross-table joins and rich transactions, uh, using a SQL store is the right solution. And if you're doing faceting and search functions, obviously search is the right solution there. Again, in terms of the data, depending upon the data structure, if it's a fixed schema, then SQL or NoSQL would help. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a JSON document, most NoSQL stores support JSON, and search also has a first-year support for JSON. Uh, again, if you're dealing with a key value, cache or NoSQL is the right, um, you know, right choice. Uh, when often, um, what is the temperature of the data? Often I think about this when I'm doing design reviews. You know, typically what I've observed is that when you're dealing with hot data, you're typically dealing with small sizes of data, typically in the order of you know, you know, bytes or kilobyte items. Uh, that tends to become a lot bigger uh, when you're dealing with, with colder data. Um, you know, the request rate tends to be very high when you're reading to caches, and the request rate tends to be fairly low when you're actually writing or reading from Glacier, for example. So uh, to be more concrete, this is sort of a mental map uh, that I have. Uh, again, a mental maps are not precise definition of things, but they, they sort of a visualization of what's in my head in a way. Um, so in terms of the hot data, 
You know, typically caches and NoSQL are the mechanisms for storing hot data. You know, searches and SQL tends to be somewhere sort of a, you know, a temperature tends to move towards uh, warm data, if you will. Uh, and S3 uh, has a wide spectrum, wider spectrum starting from a hot data set to, to a colder data set and Glacier tends to be used for cold data. The arrows below sort of, you know, show you the request rate, cost per gigabyte, latency, and data volumes. So this is sort of the mental map that I have, and most customers find that extremely helpful. In some cases, there is a tie. We will, we will, we will use a mechanism to break the tie in a moment. Uh, so what I've done here is to take in the same mental map or the concept map, uh, and then actually use physical services instead, like Elastic Cache is a cache, DynamoDB is a NoSQL store, RDS Aurora is a SQL store, Elastic Cache, Amazon Elastic Cache, Elastic Search Service um, is again a search service, um, and so on. So as you can just see, you know, it goes from milliseconds to hours. You know, if you're putting something in a cache, your time to getting the data set is usually sub one millisecond out of one millisecond if it's across multiple AZs. Whereas in the case of DynamoDB, it's about three milliseconds average for both puts and gets for 1K, 1K payload. Whereas if you move towards the right, if you're putting data in S3, typically it's in the order of a few, you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds depending on the size of the data. And then if you put something in Glacier, you're gonna wait three and a half hours for this to come back. So I wouldn't put something in Glacier that you need to get back very soon. But again, it's an archival store. You know, three and a half hours is a light years ahead for many scenarios, right? Um, and then um, in terms of the bottom line here is availability. Um, you know, DynamoDB, for example, keeps your data in three availability zones. Whenever you put a you know, do a put into DynamoDB, the data gets automatically written to two machines and at least two data centers before the put comes back in about three milliseconds, right? Um, so where, where that is, in the case of Elastic Cache, it's a two AZ uh, scenario. Uh, or in the case of um, you know, Amazon RDS, it's again uh, RDS Aurora, for example, has three AZ availability as well. So all of these are data systems. So typically your availability goes, you know, uh, I've, I've documented this thing. So typically most of them are either highly available or high, you know, high available, provide high availability. But I wouldn't put you know, your, uh, your data in a cache. For example, some pattern that I see in many customers put Redis their entire data set in Redis and call that the database. I don't consider Redis a database. It has you know, scope for failures. Typically, it's a good idea to put the data set in DynamoDB and then keep a cache in Redis, for example, uh, or memcache for that matter. So um, you know, like in some cases uh, like this, um, this is actually an email one of the developers sent me, um, a customer sent me. Uh, this person is trying to make a decision between Amazon DynamoDB and S3. It turns out um, that they are actually doing 300 writes per second uh, their object size is roughly 2K. Uh, in a month, they're gonna be collecting 1.5 terabytes of data, and the number of objects is gonna be 777 uh, million. Um, and so this is, again, a quiz for you. Um, so how many of you think we should put this data in S3? Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many think that you need to put the data in DynamoDB? Well, a few more hands, a lot more hands are raising up. So, you know, one of you is gonna lose. So does that mean bad rating for me? <laughs> so, okay, let's see. So I think uh, the easiest way to solve the tie is to actually plug in the numbers into uh, what I, in, in a, a simple monthly calculator. Uh, it's a tool that's available. How many of you know simple monthly calculator? So it's an important tool for you to know, get to know what that is because that tells you how to, how to, be, how to do cost conscious design. So if you plug in, it has a tab for each of our products. So you, for example, in, on the left tab, I've actually said, you know, I'm gonna store you know, uh, 1.5 terabytes of data. Uh, each data size, you know, item size is about 2K. When I plug in all those details, it gives me a bill. Your DynamoDB monthly bill will be $644.30. Apparently, in the case of S3, this is going to be $3,932.27. Whom so or so S3? Sorry, I think you guys lost, you know. So, uh, but, you know, um, I think you know, the difference is actually you probably were thinking storage. In fact, if you look at the storage cost, it's only $44, right, was this $261 for DynamoDB. But what makes the difference there is the put. Um, S3 charges for puts. If you have a very, very large number of puts, in other words, if you're doing lots of puts of small objects, it's gonna cost more putting the data in S3 in some scenarios. Now, $4,000 is not a lot of money for a lot of people. Uh, but it's so totally okay for some scenarios to put this in S3. But again, you know, we're being pedagogical here, you know, being a design, this being a design review. So it's best to know exactly what you're doing. And in some cases, breaking the tie 
the simple monthly calculator allows you to break the tie. Now, whenever I do a talk like this in front of 400 or 500 people, I, show, I typically show this uh, to the product manager. The person was very unhappy um, that S3 was the loser there, so I had to put a compensating scenario here. If I changed the two object size from 2K to 32K, uh, it turns out S3 wins there. Um, you know, S3 is gonna cost you, you know, $4,588 towards the right bottom versus DynamoDB, which is about $10,000, right? So what really happens there is, you know, S3 likes larger, it looks like S3 likes larger object sizes and therefore, you know, smaller number of puts. So I think we, a lot of times we bake the pricing model, we, we bake the optimal use of a product into our pricing model. You know, this, this in many cases tells you really what the right service to use. Um, so I think that's sort of a, you know, real life example that I ran through. I often go through this with customers and I found this extremely helpful. So now let's look at the various processing, uh, process and analyze phase. Uh, so in the case of processing, typically there are these types of processing here. You're either doing batch processing, where you take minutes or hours to create a monthly or a weekly bill, or it's interactive analytics. You know, somebody's sitting in front of a dashboard. It could be a Tableau or a quick side dashboard that you, you're slicing and dicing the data. It needs to be interactive. Answers needs to come back in sub-seconds or seconds. Or you're building a real-time or a stream processing system where the answers have to be materialized in milliseconds. You know, typically, you know, one second is not. You know, building systems less than a second is, is too difficult. Uh, typically, but you can process the records in milliseconds. Um, similarly, messaging systems kind of deal with hot data, and then your answers come back in milliseconds or seconds. So uh, machine learning, on the other hand, you know, gives you the ability to uh, learn without being you know, programmed. Um, Amazon machine learning service has been very popular amongst many customers. Um, and then machine learning algorithms come in you know, two major categories, you know, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Um, in, in the case of supervised learning, you basically train. You have a data set and you train a model, um, and then you perfect the model, and then the model is used for either deciding yes or no. You know, let's say, is this a fraudulent transaction, yes or no, given the characteristics of the data model I built, can you tell me whether it's, 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 it's a fraud or not? That's a typical question in the case of classification. In the case of regression, how much is this house going to sell for? You know, it's in this area. I've trained a model, you know, based on various attributes of a house, you know, the number of bedrooms, the size, the location, et cetera. You know, what is, give me a problem, you know, what is, what is this house going to sell for? You know, that's a, class of, that's a regression problem. Whereas in the case of clustering, you know, we sell a lot of, uh, you know, shoes at Amazon.com. You know, there's an automatic system which classifies the shoe into, you know, is this a casual shoe or is this a dress shoe, et cetera. You know, rather than a human doing this, we have a system that basically, you know, you know can actually do the class classification for you. If you're building a system like that, you know, using machine learning is quite helpful. Um, so what are the tools and frameworks that are available? For machine learning, um, like I said before, Spark ML. Um, uh, Spark uh, ML is very popular. You can, you can run Elastic MapReduce, which natively runs Spark, and then you can use Spark ML for, 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 for building your machine models. Uh, or you can use Amazon Machine Learning um, as well, uh, which can do both interactive and batch, batch learning. And um, in, for interactive analytics, uh, Amazon Redshift is the classic answer, uh, but customers also are using a lot of Presto and Spark on top of Elastic MapReduce for interactive analytics as well. Both Presto and Spark have like a JDBC connector that you know, your, 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 street, your applications can talk to. Uh, for batch processing, you know, classic batch processing ha ha happened in high or pig. Nowadays, Spark is being used uh, for faster batch processing using in-memory techniques as well. And MapReduce has been around for a long time. For messaging, SQS, as we discussed, is the right solution for streaming. There are two classic categories there. If you're dealing with micro-batching, which is essentially running windowing functions, you know, give me an average over the last one minute or 20 seconds or 30 seconds, for example, uh, you can use Spark streaming with a windowing you know, duration, if you will. Or you can build the same using Kinesis, client, Kinesis client library. In the case of real time, if you're doing real time uh, streaming, then Apache Storm has been very popular for a long time, it's been around for a long time. More, um, and then uh, Kinesis Analytics is a new product that we, we are, uh, it is in private beta. If you're interested in Amazon Kinesis Analytics, um, I think you can actually put your details in a form, we'll give you private access to Kinesis Analytics. Think of that as, you know, Spark streaming without having to run um, any clusters, if you will, and uh, you know, magic happens behind. I think we'll be launching this, this offering fairly soon, uh, but you can, you can actually take it for a spin right now if you're interested by subscribing. Uh, AWS Lambda, as my, Matt pointed out in the keynote, is, is super popular. Um, a lot of the ETL processing is moving to 
you know, serverless compute, uh, which is Lambda. Uh, KCL, Kinesis Client Library, is also very popular, um, and uh, those are the techniques. Again, uh, what I've done, uh, I've also done the same thing here in terms of compared the various processing, stream processing technologies across various attributes, such as scale, whether it's a micro batch or real time, is it a managed service? You know, what are the scalability limits, if any? Uh, what are the availability? I want to touch on availability. You know, Spark streaming, uh, when it runs on top of Elastic MapReduce, is still a single AZ solution, but as AWS Lambda automatically runs in multiple availability zones. So if you are actually doing Spark streaming on top of EMR uh, to process your streaming data, uh, if you're worried about availability, you need to have a mechanism to actually run another cluster in case an availability zone fails, right? Um, so I think I, you know, most customers sort of, you know, think about this after the fact. I just wanted to highlight that piece here as part of this slide. Um, and then, so um, I'm going to leave this slide for homework um, and move forward. Uh, in terms of what analytics technology should I use, typically Amazon Redshift is a great place to start. Um, you know, you can put until 1.6 petabyte. I think NTT Docomo has a cluster which is more than two petabytes. If you need more than 1.6 petabytes, you can talk to us. We can, you know, special enable you for more than that. Um, it, it, it's full fidelity SQL. It's ANSI SQL compliant. Whereas if you move towards the right side of running Presto or Spark or Hive on top of Elastic MapReduce, you know, Presto has very high SQL compatibility, whereas in the case of Spark, it's Spark SQL, you know, is not full-fledged um, ANSI SQL. Um, as well as you know, HiveQL, HQL is not full-fledged ANSI. So if you're using all kinds of tools such as Tableau, et cetera, uh, or anything that talks JDBC, chances are using a full-fidelity SQL is going to be fairly important for you. And uh, Redshift is a good place to start uh, for most customers. If you want to go open source, uh, probably Presto would be a great place to start for, uh, for, uh, for your own solutions. Um, what about ETL? Um, we have a product called a AWS Data Pipeline. You know, think of that as a cron or an orchestration service that would wake up, you know, do the ETL job and actually shut down. It'll, it'll bring up a EMR cluster, that's the classic use, and then run some ETL and transform the data and put that into, into an appropriate store, if you will. Uh, there's also a lot of amazing tools from our data integration partners, you know, Attenuity, Informatica, uh, Metellian, SnapLogic, and Alteryx also has some great solutions there. Uh, now, we're moving into the consume stage, and uh, in the case of cons consume stage, you know, typically you're consuming applications. Uh, they could be human beings uh, that are consuming the data that you put into either store or, or, or your processing tier, or it could be services uh, that, are, that are actually supporting other downstream applications that you can build. Um, so if you're a business user, typically you're actually, you know, slicing and dicing the data uh, through QuickSight or Tableau or Looker or MicroStrategy. Uh, those tools work fairly well with a lot of data services that we talked about. Uh, if you're a data scientist um, or a developer, you may be building dashboards using, you know, like a Flot or D3 SDKs, um, SDKs if you will, or more importantly, data scientists are now using a lot of notebooks, uh, Zeppelin, and IPython notebooks are fairly popular. Uh, we have an AWS blog for big data that has you know, two explicit blogs on how do you run Zeppelin on top of EMR, also how do you run IPython notebook um, in the AWS environment. So if you, if you have a lot of data scientists that want to share and process a large amounts of data, you know, actually giving them these notebook abstractions is quite powerful and helpful. You know, a lot of data scientists use uh, RStudio as well for processing the data. So, so those are some of the, some of the consume tier options. Now, putting it all together, uh, here's sort of the reference architecture uh, that I derived out of. Now, um, you know, this will be available for you for downloads and, and future reference, but now let's actually uh, do some design patterns. Um, so here's a primitive design pattern. You know, like I talked bef said before, uh, when you're building a big data pipeline, you should be thinking about building decoupled systems, which typically comprises of you know, the stored process, stored process repeating itself with the storage subsystem decoupling multiple processing stages. Uh, if you're using a stream storage subsystem, such as Amazon Kinesis or Kafka, uh, what these systems allow you to do, um, the processing applications, multiple processing applications um, can read uh, from, from stream storage subsystems. In this case, Kinesis S3 connector is reading from Kinesis and writing to S3. In parallel, AWS Lambda is also processing the same data set and taking the metadata and putting that in DynamoDB. Um, now, if you, if you decouple it this way, if you decouple storage from processing or analysis, in this case, a Spark cluster is actually building a query based on the data that goes into you know, S3. 
um, and, and DynamoDB, and also you know, joining that with, uh, with Spark streaming analytics as well. So, so that's a classic design pattern. Now, what I've done here in this slide is to, you know, we talked about the various temperature of the data. You know, you're dealing with hot data or cold data um, or warm data. And then typically hot data go to, goes into Kinesis or Kafka. Amazon DynamoDB can be used for both hot data as well as warm data. And S3 is typically used for warm data uh, and cold data as well. You know, if you put the data in Kinesis, you can run either Spark Streaming or Storm or AWS Lambda or KCL to process that. You know, the, the length of the arrow from, from those boxes like uh, indicates the processing speed. If it's fast, it gets done faster, which means a shorter arrow. And if it takes a long time in the case of Hive towards the right, it takes a long time to process the data. So the combination of this, you know, when you're dealing with real-time analytics, typically you're putting that in a hot store and, and, and processing the data using a fast processing technology. If you're dealing with interactive analytics, typically you put the data in either a hot or a warm store and you process, a use a processing mechanism that, that does processing fairly fast. In the case of batch, again, your processing mechanism can be pretty slow in the case of Hive. Uh, so here is a classic you know, pattern for real-time analytics. Your data you know, stream goes into either Kinesis or Kafka or DynamoDB stream. I'll probably start with Kinesis. Uh, and then you can use either KCL or AWS Lambda. If you want to do serverless processing, you can use AWS Lambda. All you need to do is run a, run a function to process the data. But then you can't do any you know, windowing functions and such because you know, the, the way the Kinesis AWS Lambda works is the, a bunch of records is handed out to a Lambda function, and the Lambda function can run in any, any, any process. So you can't do, you know, like a give me the average, max, min, and all those functions, but if you do simple ETL or, or if you're doing alerting based on, you know, is the temperature more than 100 degrees, then go ahead and send a notification that you can easily build using Lambda. Uh, Spark streaming uh, similarly can be used for um, a wide variety of processing tasks, and so, so does Apache Storm. And the way to build real-time uh, machine learning into it is basically you do a lookup. A real, you can do a real, if you, if you build your machine mo learning model in Amazon Machine Learning, you can do a real-time lookup before you decide whether, the, whether this transaction that's coming in is a fraud or not. If it's fraud, you basically send an SNS notification alerting some system downstream system that this is a potential fraud. Uh, and uh, typically what happens is an application state, uh, even though you're, you're doing real-time processing, you keep an application state in, in a, in a database or a cache such as Redis uh, or DynamoDB or RDS or Elasticsearch, and then you have a KPI, uh, then you draw your KPIs by reading from those data stores. That acts as a nice decoupling mechanism between the tier that's, that's doing the drawings as well as the, you know, the tier that's actually processing the data and populating the database, uh, if you will. For event or message processing, typically you can use an auto-scaling group. Um, you can do this using Elastic Beanstalk. Um, you can you know, basically run an Elastic Beanstalk SQS application that can process from a queue and then you know, store the application state as before uh, into any of those you know, st uh, storage mechanisms or you can, you can actually do uh, downstream, you can do a publish to SNS and have downstream subscribers subscribe to it. And also some, in some cases you, you chain various queues. You know, the first tier processes and, and picks out all the high priority messages, puts that in a downstream queue for high priority processing and low priority processing. So this is a typical architecture that's used for that kind of a message or event processing. Um, so uh, what about interactive analytics? If you have streaming data going in, putting the data in Firehose and then transporting the data to S3 or Redshift, uh, and now from starting tomorrow, Elasticsearch, to, to do interactive analytics is, is a very viable option. Or you can also run batch analytics you know, using Hive or PEG on the same data. Again, Amazon Machine Learning can be, can be useful for doing batch predictions. So if you have a bunch of records and if you want to basically hand off those records to Amazon Machine Learning and ask it to do predictions, it'll do the predictions and put the data in S3. You can read the data back and actually you know, build that uh, intelligence as part of your processing pipeline. If it's real time, it can also do real time lookups. Is this a fraudulent transaction? Yes or no? It'll consult the model and say, yes, this looks like a fraud, or perhaps no, this doesn't look like a fraud. Um, and then Lambda architecture, as we talked about, is uh, actually you know, doing a combination of both. In the case of a Lambda architecture, you know, your data goes into something uh, Kinesis, and then you have a connector that takes the data from Kinesis and writes it to S3. And then you can actually use any of the technologies that we talked before, like Redshift or EMR, to process the data and materialize an answer. Uh, for speed processing on a fast-moving data sets, you can use any of these technologies in the boxes, you know, KCL or Lambda, 
um, to, to compute the answer, and then you can, you, can, you can persist that into what I call as a serving layer, which nicely decouples the application on the right side from, from, your, from your processing applications. And this is a typical architecture for doing um, a Lambda architecture on AWS. And, uh, and you can also build machine learning into this by doing machine learning lookups um, at the processing stage and take appropriate actions based on what your machine learning system um, you know, tells you. And that machine learning lookups can happen you know, using Amazon Machine Learning or it could be uh, you know, Spark ML as well. Um, now in summary, um, you know, building decoupled systems is important. If you're building a big data processing pipeline, please ensure that this is nice decoupling between that allows you to change the various components as well um, as newer technologies come in. And um, using the right tool for the job is fairly important. You know, uh, you should pick a tool based on the data structure, you know, hot or cold access patterns, as well as the hot or cold data sets that you're dealing with. Um, using Lambda architecture ideas like we talked about is fairly important. Um, if you did persist, one thing there is I often ensure that when, when, when people are building you know, data processing systems, stream processing systems, or the customers actually have the actual data stream persisted in S3 for further analytics, if you will, is very key. And then the, the ideas of using you know, compositing systems from batch um, and speed and, and, and real-time processing using and serving using a serving layer is, is, is fairly important and scalable. Uh, literally, every single real-time bidding system uses a Lambda architecture of sorts under the covers. Uh, and then using AWS managed services is key. Rather than reinventing the wheel, you can, we've already made the wheel for you. It's nice to probably just assemble the wheel as it is and use it, um, unless you see uh, a reason not to use it. Uh, I would start with the managed service, uh, such as DynamoDB or Kinesis, uh, S3, et cetera. Um, also, uh, all these systems are elastic, um, and there's no, almost no low or no admin. And last but not the least, uh, be super cost conscious. Uh, by picking the cheapest solution, you're probably picking the best tool to do the job by the best subsystem. Your end-to-end -end cost should be, should be very, you know, um, very, very low cost. Uh, big data should not be equals big cost. Often this has helped me to, to weed out the wrong tools, if you will. Well, that's it. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to stay here and take any questions. And uh, hope that was helpful. Thank you.